It's so good to see each one of you this morning. Amen. I appreciate you being here today. You could have chose to be anywhere else, but you chose to be with us, and I thank you. Good to, good to have some visitors this morning. Amen. Y'all please make yourself at home. They've been here. Y'all been Miss here before? Miss Amanda Wright. Yes, ma'am. And CJ. Miss and Eldray. LJ. And, and Tate. And Tate. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Look at the big brain on my mama this morning. Uh, hey, them young boys told me their name. I went back. I even got a hug this morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Either way, y'all just make yourself at home. Hey, Amen. Don't forget dinner. That's right. <laughs> Everybody eats. If you have your Bibles, turn them to the book of Matthew, chapter 17. And this morning, we're going to be talking about no offense. And, and honestly, I find myself here on a, on a number of occasions. You, you know, the message that we carry is quite offensive to the world. That the message of the cross, the, the message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone can be very offensive to the world. But you know, I strive because I believe the Word of God teaches us so to live a life that is not offensive. Now, I can't help if the message offends you. I really can't. That's not my part. My part Amen. is to deliver. Amen. Now, but I do hope that my lifestyle, I do hope that my delivery method, I, I do hope that the, the amount of scripture I use and, and, or, or however you want to look at it or my preaching style is not offensive. It is never my intentions to offend. Like I said, I really can't help if the message offends you because the message is not mine but the Lord's. Amen. Everybody understand that. But this morning I want to talk to you about no offense because the Lord says it here just shortly. In Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 24. I thought we were having a T.D. Jakes moment for a second there. Praise God. Matthew 17, verse 24 says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And, and when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we offend them. Go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take, give unto them for me and thee. Now, understand, with the hearts of the disciples still sorrow, no, no doubt that their minds and their hearts are still wondering about how Jesus, the master they've been following for approximately two years now, has been so fatalistic in his language lately, how morbid he seems to be because he keeps talking about a future time that is coming when he is going to be betrayed, beaten, killed, and raised. I can, I can just imagine the melancholy attitude that must have been had settled over the disciples. See, and, and Jesus is looking ahead, though, with the cross in mind. You see, he looks forward at, with his mission in mind, with his purpose unchanged. And, and he continues his itinerant ministry. Remember, he has moved away from Nazareth. He has moved his, his, head, his headquarters, if you will, into Capernaum. This is where Jesus spends his time to rest. It's where he sends the disciples out from. So he comes back to just say home. And it's here, some of our most favorite prosperity preachers, this is where they like to preach from. They, they really enjoy this story, but of course, I'm going to tell you today that prosperity is not what this story is about. Amen. See, our prosperity pals would be shocked to hear Amen. that this story has much less to do about money and much more to do about our position in Christ. Amen. 
and exactly who Jesus is. You see, really it's not about money, and I want you to understand, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something about money in just a second, because some people need to learn from a very basic principle that, that comes out of this story. Verse 4, 24 says, As they arrived there in the Capernaum, a tax collector came to Peter to inquire about Jesus. Catch that. He, he came to Peter and asking Peter, does Jesus pay the temple tax? Now, if, if you need the, the references, you can, you can go to Exodus 30 and 13, 2 Chronicles 24 9, and Nehemiah 10, 32. See, God through Moses, and then reestablished in, in Chronicles and Nehemiah, there is a tax on all men over the age of 20 years old and older for the upkeep of the temple. You see, the, the, the tabernacle and then the temple required constant maintenance. I don't know if you understand just how hard it is to keep up a church. It is in constant need of cleaning. The temple and the tabernacle needed 24-hour day tending because it needed what? A constant flow of resources. There had to be incense. There had to be wood and animals and bread. There was always something needed in the temple to prepare and to continue the continuous worship of God Almighty. So the Lord knowing that, that first of all, Israelite men especially who are extra hard-headed, probably wouldn't do it willingly. He, he implemented it as part of the law. In other words, it was a duty placed on the men so that God's house would be maintained. By being an Israelite, by being a part of God's nation, they were obligated to maintain the house of God. Now, why does it matter? Well, first of all, the temple and, the, and our modern day church is the symbol of where we go to meet God. Amen. There are many people who will get up every morning and pray. They get up and they read their Bible and they, and they meet God. But you know, there are thousands and millions of people who do not understand that they can do that. The only picture they have of God and being able to meet with God is in a building. So if we do nothing else but maintain a nice building so people understand that we love God, that's a good thing. You see, now us, you know, God made Himself known in the Old Testament and, and He used this opportunity to point people to Himself. But today, we're saved by grace. It's nothing about our work. But you realize that if, if God's grace is thought of as greasy grace, it's no grace at all. But even today in the age of grace, we have responsibility. So here is just a very simple truth. And, it, and it's a principle. The local church is to be maintained and filled by God's people. At the end of the day, now, now, we're not called to, to build Jesus' church. He said He would do it. The gates of hell would not prevail. But we are to be filling the kingdom. We are to be teaching the people of the kingdom. We are to be giving them and providing them a place to come for corporate worship. You see, we, we have a responsibility. We have a duty. We have an obligation. But more than that, we have a privilege. We have a privilege to come and give. We have a privilege to come and be a part of what God's doing. See, so you understand that when, you know, we don't beg for money around here. Amen. See, see, I'm of, a, I'm of the opinion. Everybody in here, with the exception of the children, are grown and understand what bills are. Okay, you understand that we have good air conditioning here. Thank God for it. Amen. If you go to the bathrooms, the toilets are going to flush because the water is running. Amen. I don't know if you've counted these chandeliers in here, but there's a light bulb in every socket. And I think I put most of them in. Just saying. But you know, everything's clean. 
Because there's cleaning supplies. You understand? Everything in a church, in a church building, needs maintenance. It needs people to pay it some attention, and it requires money. So we're not going to beg you for money because we know that you know at your house it takes money to make your household operate. You want groceries and, and you like light bills. I've told you, Tina does such an excellent job paying bills and stuff. Because I'm going to tell you, it does not work well when you walk in, you flip the switch and lights don't come on and you go, need to pay the light bill. That is not the time to pay bills. Amen. Or you try to use the phone, it doesn't work. You go ding, ding, ding. I need to pay the phone bill. I superintend that stuff at home, but understand that, that just a very basic, some good walking around sense will let you know every church, hear me, every church, every local body, all those large ministries you see on television need money and resources to operate. Now just so you understand, I'm not asking you for money today. I, I take it as a, as a privilege to be able to come and preach. I take it as a privilege to be able to come and worship. I take it as a privilege to be able to come and give to the ministry that God is doing. Amen. Amen. So, just so you know, simple truth. I don't care if you're talking about a business or church. It all takes money to operate in our nation. Everybody understand that? Amen. That's all really I want to talk about as far as money. But now there is a difference between what that temple tax was then and what we think of now. See, the, the difference is, is God mandated it to Israel because he knew they were hard-headed and would not do it willingly. So he made it part of the law. See, but it's understood in the New Testament that we have enjoyed the abundance of grace and that we as believers and people who have been grafted into the family of God, people that have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light would see it as an opportunity to give. We would see it as an opportunity to invest in the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says it this way, This I say, He which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. And understand, don't let anybody trick you or guilt you or put you on some kind of guilt trip to give. No, no, don't do it of necessity because God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Think about it. Take it as an opportunity to come and give of your time, talent, and your resources. Now, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time today to talk about the, the means and the methods of how this temple tax was to be taken and used. But understand this. There was an immense surplus by the time of Jesus' day of men over 20 years old who were paying this tax because they were required to. They had this great surplus that they began decorating because they had nothing else to spend the money on. I can tell you also that there was such a great surplus that even after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Romans continued to extract this tax because there was a good way to make money. That's not the point of the story. It's just not. I want you to just get the picture in your mind, though. We see Jesus and his disciples moving into Capernaum, and, G and, and Peter probably, just like always, dragging up the rear. See, I'm a firm believer that, G uh, that Jesus had picked Peter because Peter had the right personality and needed lots of grace. And I also believe Peter was the oldest son. I believe Peter understood his position. I believe he always drug up the rear because he felt the need to watch out for everybody else, even Jesus. And we'll see it in his attitude. Because what it says is, is they come walking into town and a Jewish tax collector, understand, he's come from the temple. He is coming to collect a Jewish temple tax. So what, what would be the first thing pop into your mind if there's a Jewish tax collector coming? He's a religious individual. He looks the part. He sounds the part. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is something that always happens when the religious interact with Jesus. Y'all know what it is? They always get it handed back to them and it's not good. 
Remember, if a religious person comes to Jesus, they are up to no good. When you read the, 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 the Gospels, you notice that every time the religious people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, when they come to Jesus, they are not coming for a good purpose. They are always coming up to no good. Amen. And you realize that this time, though, it says that the religious people come and confront Peter. You see, if, if they can't get over on Jesus, safe to say it was intentional that this tax collector was very intentional about coming and confronting Peter, not Jesus. He knows that if he goes and asks Jesus a question, Jesus is going to hand it right back to him. He's going to run away with his tail tucked between his legs. But he comes and he asks Peter a very simple question. And I'm going to break it down into a language I can understand. He comes up and grabs Peter. Hey man, does your master, does Jesus pay the temple tax? Now, without hesitation, I believe, Peter says, well, of course he does. He's Jesus. He's perfect. You see, you understand, they picked the wrong one. If they'd have been smart, they'd have grabbed one off the front. They really would have because they'd have stuttered and stepped along and tried to step. No, no. Peter automatically steps up to the plate because understand, just recently Peter has made this great revelation of who Jesus is. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He has witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. He has seen and heard Moses and Elijah. I don't think Peter was the right one. You see, Peter has seen Jesus face down the weather. He has seen Jesus walk upon the raging seas. He has seen Jesus take authority over sickness and over the devil and even over death itself. He's been rebuked by Jesus. He's been reprimanded by Jesus. He's been schooled by Jesus. Remember how we started service. He says, the disciples asked him, why couldn't we cast him out? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. If you had just this much faith, man, if you had just faith as a mustard seed, you could say to a mountain, get out of here, and it has to go. He's been schooled by the Master. But you understand, it is not about the size of your faith, but about who your faith is. So I think Peter is riding a high now of understanding that this is Jesus. He's the Son of God. I've seen what He can do. And they come and ask me a stupid question. Does Peter or does Jesus follow the law? That's what they were asking. Does Jesus follow the law? And Peter immediately says, well, of course He does. How dare you question the integrity of Jesus? Now, let me go ahead and tell you, that may have not been the best course of action because I myself find myself there. I've, I've told you, it is much easier to believe that, that in cessationalism, it is much easier to believe that everything has ceased. It's so much easier to believe that because when you start telling people you believe about miracles and healing and about how God brings peace above everything else, and, and, and they go, well, show me. But Peter, like many of us, feels compelled to defend Jesus. Of course he pays the tax, man. He's Jesus. He, he defends Jesus' character. He defends his integrity. You know, we, we often need to remember that we are called to be watchmen on the wall. We are to be watchmen on the wall, but not for the Lord's sake. He can take care of Himself. We are to be on the watchmen on the wall for the sheep. We are to be the watchmen on the wall for our nation. We are to be watchmen on the wall. We are to be defenders of the faith, not of Jesus. Jesus does not need your defense. Because if you try, you're going to, make, you're going to mess up. 1 Peter, though, tells us, 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, understand Peter must have been asked over and over and over again, how can you, a fisher, 
tell me that a carpenter from Nazareth came, lived, died, raised again, and now you're saved because of that work, and you walk around, you ought to be angry and mad because the Lord promised you several things. He promised that you'd be fearless. He promised that you would be joyful. And He promised that you would be persecuted. Peter says, you just be ready to answer that. The Lord does not need our help. The Lord does not need our defending Him. He can do it quite well Himself. Now, this, this is, I'm going to call it a taste of how the devil approaches his people, or, or Jesus' people. Have y'all ever noticed that the devil doesn't go and, and beat up on Jesus? He knows that's a lost cop, right? He can't do anything with Jesus. Jesus has already defeated him. Jesus is the conquering king. So instead what he does is he comes to those that are lagging behind, those that feel the need to, to follow Jesus from a distance. He comes around and he plants seeds of doubt in the minds of the followers of Jesus. Remember Jesus' temptation in the, in the desert was this, if you are the Son of God, turn the stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down and, and want the angels rescue you. If you are the Son of God, Bow down and worship me, the devil says. He knows he can't beat Jesus. But so what he'll do is he'll want to plant doubts about the integrity of our Lord. He wants to plant doubts about his character. He wants to plant doubts that God is good all the time. He wants to plant doubts that God is kind. God is gracious. God is loving. He wants you, I'm talking about the devil, wants you to doubt those things. Because if he can get you to doubt those things, he can get you to move away from them. So he comes to Peter through a Jewish tax collector with a very benign question. Does Jesus pay his taxes? Does Jesus obey the law? Now, I don't know about y'all, I had to... Do you ever get the question from somebody, does Jesus really save? You're telling me about how, how He saved you and, and how things are, are so much better and how the Lord has raised people up. Does He still do that? Does the Lord, does the Lord really heal? Does the Lord really save? Does the Lord really deliver? Is He really coming again? You've been saying this for years and years and years. Is it really true? So they come with these benign questions, but you understand, just like the devil, they don't really want to know either. Because if they sincerely wanted to know, they would go to Jesus himself. This tax collector did not want to know if Jesus was going to pay his taxes. He was trying to collect money. He was trying to get Peter to doubt the integrity of his Lord. You know why people won't go to Jesus? Unbelievers won't. Because if they do, they'll immediately be confronted with their sin. When you go and stand before the perfect Son of God, the first thing you will see are your shortcomings, your sin. And another thing, if you go and confront the Master yourself, you're going to be confronted with His love and His grace and His mercy and all that hate and all that anger, all that unforgiveness, all that bitterness. If you sincerely go to the Lord for questions to be answered, the first thing He will do is point out what you need. And you know they are so scared that the Lord might actually say them. The Lord makes you born again. You are changed. And it will be a continual thing. You'll start growing. The Lord does the change. But they don't want Him. The same reason that a, a thief doesn't want a policeman, he's not interested. And you, you know what? Most of them don't want anyone else to know Jesus either. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you. If Peter would have been quick on his feet, much more witty than me. If he would have just said this, when the man goes, man, does your master pay taxes? Jesus would have said, go ask him yourself. Go talk to Jesus.
says, I want to see you confront him about the law. He has never lied. He has never stolen. He is the master. He is the king of kings. <laughs> Go talk to him yourself. How many of us could learn a lesson from that right there? But now we see that Jesus is all knowing. See, in the book of Matthew, we, we understand the book of Matthew was written to Jews. You could tell Matthew was writing with an attitude that his listeners knew what he was talking about. And also, let, let me tell you this. Understanding that this was written to Jews, Matthew at times seems to distance himself from the godness of Jesus. You see... Mark and John and Luke focus in on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. At times, Matthew seems to withdraw. It is not, not, not meant to, to hurt anybody, but it's kind of like this attitude here. There's no need to cause unnecessary offense. Jesus knows. And in verse 25, we see that as He's coming into the house, Peter dragging up the rear. Jesus stops at the door and turns and says, All right, Peter, go ahead and get it off your chest, man. I know what you're thinking. So he says to him, he says, Do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or strangers? Before Peter has a time, has a chance, because I guarantee you, Peter, as bold as he is, was fixing to go in there and tell Jesus, Do you know they're saying you don't pay your taxes, Jesus? Do you realize that they know that you don't? The seeds of doubt, but Jesus knowing turns and just goes ahead and hits him head on with questions of his own. He says, Who do the kings of this world take taxes from? You see, Jesus uses this as a teachable moment. See, see Peter, rather than pointing them to Jesus as he should have, he thought and took it upon himself to obligate the Lord to do something. Peter, with all his experiences, Peter, with all of his revelation, still hasn't gotten it that Jesus is the Son of God. He is still processing that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is still processing that Jesus is the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus is all-powerful, and He just hasn't gotten it. So it's in this short exchange that we have some of the most theologically deep, some of the most in-depth Christology, or Christology if you want, that is here, and it is in the most simplest terms. Jesus asked Peter, he says, of who do the kings of the earth take tribute? Of his children or of strangers? The question is simple. Would you know the answer if Jesus were to ask you that? See, here, let me, let me pose the question this way. When a conquering king comes into a nation and, and, and subdues another nation, who does the conquering king take taxes from? From his own family? From those that accompanied him to take over the land? Or does he take taxes from those that have been conquered? Well, of course he takes it from those that have been conquered. You see, if you're a part of the royal family, you don't know anything. See, in an earthly kingdom, the king's kids have what Jesus said, which is freedom. They are exempt from these taxes. They are exempt from paying a portion. But see, he's trying to tell Peter that I am the king. And you are Positionally speaking, a child of God. He's talking about the position of, the, of every believer. He says that children live tax free. Children live tribute free. Now, before anybody gets off on the wrong, wrong path, I'm not telling you not to pay your taxes. The IRS will come get you. They will send you letters. And we have a, an obligation as United States citizens to pay our taxes because we like good roads. And we like good fire protection and police protection. Trust me, your, all your taxes do not go to waste. So I'm not telling you not to pay your taxes. What Jesus is saying, the requirements of the law, He has fulfilled the law. And we are free 
We have liberty in Jesus Christ. The things that we ought to do now become privileges rather than obligations. You see, even the law itself made provision for the priests and they were administrators. They're the picture of God's family because even the priests were exempt from this time. Thank God we are kings and priests in Jesus Christ. We are exempt Amen. from the law. Peter answers rightly though, and Jesus gives five words. Five words that declares who He is. He says, then are the children free. The children are free. You, you see, Jesus said, I don't owe the tax. I am greater than the temple. He has mentioned this before. He says, I am the creator. I am the sustainer. The temple is mine. My Father owns it all. And because you belong to me, you are free. But here's the whole point of the story. Jesus says, notwithstanding, but just so we don't offend, go get the money and pay. No offense. I don't owe it. But so I can continue to talk to them, so I can continue to interact with them, so I don't create a breach between me and them, I'll pay the tax just to have opportunity to minister to them. Wouldn't that be awesome if us as a church, us as an individual, would live our lives in such a way and agree with the Apostle Paul and say, Lord, don't let me do anything that causes a brother to stump. I won't smoke it, drink it. I won't do anything if it causes anybody else to stumble. Lord, I want to live a life of no offense. I want to live a life so that they understand they can come talk to me so that I can tell them the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what this life is for. And, and Jesus says, I don't owe it, but I'll pay it. Now, the interesting part of this is everybody focuses on the direction of the miracle. Can, can I just tell you that I enjoy it and I see this as the sense of humor of God? Because we see Jesus give Peter direction. He says, go down to the lake, cast in a hook, and the first fish you pull up, in other words, in case you, go, in case you keep fishing, the first one you pull up, look in his mouth, get a piece of money, and go pay my tax, and your tax. <coughs> Here's the thing. Something just to note. Peter, I believe, is the oldest. He is older than 20 years old during this time. Mm -hmm. Peter hadn't paid his taxes either. Mm -hmm. Just say it. You know why that temple man come and hit Peter up first? Because he didn't want to talk to Jesus and he knew Peter owed money too. Mm -hmm. If you don't think anybody cares, miss a payment and you'll find out who loves you. Mm -hmm. Amen. But now this miracle is not just a creative miracle. It is not just a, a miracle of power and dominion or, or how Jesus has power over the elements. We've seen all this. We've seen Jesus talk the storm down. We've seen Jesus walk on water. We've seen Him speak to death and death run. We've seen Him cast out demons of the worst kind. But you understand the Lord is all-powerful. Jesus has dominion over everything, even His creation, even the animal kingdom. It makes me think of Noah and the ark. It says when the time came, they came two and two onto the ark. Noah didn't go out capturing animals to put them on the ark. When the Lord spoke, the animals moved on the ark. And you understand that not only in the providence of God did Jesus know there was a fish in that lake with a piece of money in its mouth, He also knew that, that somebody dropped a piece of money in that lake and He told that fish, just go ahead and tell you, in, in fish language, whatever, however God communicates with fish, he says, you go scoop that fish, scoop that money up and go wait. And when Peter drops his hook, you get on his hook. And you know the animal kingdom even obeys the Father. Right. Now, and even that is not the point of the story. The, the point of the miracle is not that Jesus even controls the animal kingdom. Do you know what the point of this miracle is? Is Peter did not argue. A carpenter from Galilee, a carpenter Jesus of Nazareth, is telling Peter, a lifelong fisherman, to go fish. He's telling him how to go fish, where to go fish, and what he was going to find. 
Now about that time, when the Lord starts telling me how to do what I know how to do, I start arguing with him. And I know you don't, all you good sanctified people. But listen to me. Peter does not argue. Peter does not question. Now he just a couple of days ago was questioning Jesus about, no, you're not going to die. You, no, you quit talking that way. But not now. He tells him to go do something he already knows how to do. And Peter goes and does it. Peter shows us faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in His Word. Jesus has already caused that fish to get that piece of money. He has already caused that fish to be in position. And that piece of money is enough to pay Jesus' tax and Peter's. And he done it all so he would not be an offense to the religious. Jesus is meek and mild. Jesus loving. And he desires not to offend. He has no desire for us to be offensive. Especially those that, that need a touch from Him. Jesus is enough. Jesus has enough for you. He has enough for me. He has enough grace. He has a, enough love. He has enough provision. See, today a word for some of you today. Somebody listening today needs to hear all that to say this one thing. The Lord knows where you are. And you need to do like Peter. You need to follow His instructions. You need to cast in by faith. And see what comes up. Some of you today have clear instructions. And rather than walking out in faith and going down and casting into the sea, you're arguing with Him. Say, Lord, that's not the way we do it down here. The Lord says it like this. Today, if you'll hear my voice, harden not your heart. What we need today more than anything else is a spirit that listens and a spirit that is willing to move. Amen. Will you stand this morning? We'll stop. Not done, but we'll stop. The offer's open this morning. If you'd like to come pray, we'll pray with you. If you don't like to do it that way, you stay where you are and pray. On this national day of prayer. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the opportunity to come and be in your house. Lord, we thank you for a, for a good word. Lord, I pray that you would be with us today. Lord, that you would let the word go in. That there would be none offended by how it was said. Lord, that there would be truth that would go in the hearts. Father, we just pray that each one today would seek after you and seek after your will. Lord, help us not do anything that would cause you grief. Help us to move in your direction in Jesus' name.